the recording of the content. So today, um, we will be uh, picking up um, uh, the momentum where we left off last time on communicable disease modeling. I'm going to do a, a brief review because last time it was intermixed with discussion of, kind of the irreducibility of the um, of nonlinear systems. Um, and we're going to be uh, proceeding uh, through a brief review of the common structures of those systems, such as we see in, in models like SIR, SEIR, uh, SIRS, et cetera. And we'll be talking about some of the key drivers within those systems. Um, we'll be introducing concepts that are foundational in infectious disease epi, like the basic reproductive number, the effective reproductive number, and the force of infection. Um, and uh, take a look at the key role, the key governing role that the fraction of susceptible people play in the context of the dynamics of communicable diseases. Um, now, our exploration on this will be um, limited because we need to get on to uh, successive explora explorations of how successive techniques from data science can synergize with these models. But I need to ensure that you have enough background in these sorts of models, these models of communicable disease, to, um, to, to, under, to appreciate the um, central significance of some of these terms, um, which form the basis of inquiry with data science techniques to understand uh, data science techniques that are operating on these models uh, to infer key parameters like the, uh, uh, the probability of transmission per discordant contact or, the, uh, uh, or, or to infer the recovery time from, from infection. Uh, in order to appreciate the significance of that and um, to understand how those data science techniques um, shed insight, uh, we need to have some basic understanding of these transmission models. Um, we will uh, also be talking about some of the defining features of dynamics of these models, particularly when it comes to infectious disease models and communicable disease models, because they are nonlinear um, and because of other aspects of that structure. Um, we will often be dealing with multiple, as we say, basins of attraction, cases where the system can have multiple modes of behavior or regimes of behavior, cases where the system may, may behave very differently in one mode, say around a disease-free equilibrium, um, from around an endemic equilibrium. And it may exhibit behavior around an endemic equilibrium that's not truly in total quiescence, but circles around it. So to point to some of these issues, um, I'll be walking through um, some of the major cases we tend to examine with these transmission models with closed populations and with open populations um, and uh, understanding how they exhibit different dynamics. Uh, so that will set us up for our exploration of data science techniques. This is a lot of material. In my course, which happens to be transpiring right now back here at the U of S, um, I, I use about five lectures on uh, the modeling of infectious and communicable diseases. And we're gonna be trying to compress this into really like a lecture and a half. But, but going light on a lot of uh, the materials, we dive into more detail, the, uh, uh, the, the particular ways in which vaccination affects things, the critical vaccination fraction, um, solving for equilibria within these models, demonstrating the stability of those equilibria. That's covered in my other course. Um, I'm glad to provide links if people are interested in that material. Um, but we're not gonna be able to cover that within this course because uh, we have exciting things to cover on the data science side uh, that will greatly enhance our ability to understand systems that we're modeling. Um, 
they'll complement the dynamic models with rich data grounded understanding uh, that is often um, updated on an ongoing basis as new empirical understanding and new empirical observations come in. So that's the plan for today. Um, so having um, offered my preface, I'm just going to dive in to some of the slides here. I did uh, place these slides uh, on the site last night. Um, and if any of you are interested in following along, you are, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, they are uh, a set that has been uh, altered, enhanced, and extended uh, since I originally uh, posted them on Monday. Okay, so um, compartmental model of infectious disease. Um, uh, we introduced last time some of the basics here, so I'll, I'll just quickly touch on it. Um, uh, the karmic mckendrick model, which uh, dates back to 1927, introduced a simple structure where we have susceptibles, infected, and recovered individuals. And uh, governing the evolution of this system, we have these, um, these flows, these transitions. Um, uh, the susceptible infected recovered are in some sense the nouns here. The flows between them are kind of the verbs where the action takes place. To make sure that everyone's aligned with this, particularly those who might be from statistical background, I wanna ensure that when people look at a model like this, you realize we're characterizing a process here. This is a characterization of um, a process that's posited to operate in the world, uh, a process that evolves over time. So at any one time, we have a number, a particular number of susceptibles, a particular number of infectives, and a particular number of recovered individuals. And over time, those numbers change as people become infected or as people recover, or for cases where we'll examine an open population, people arrive uh, in the susceptible state through birth or immigration. Uh, so we're depicting a process here. And this is a process that from the standpoint of the language of uh, statistics will be, will be called um, one that has substantive latent structure. Typically, in a system such as this, we're lucky to have observations on one or two pieces of this, perhaps um, something about the number of cases of, of infection that are, are being reported, for example, associated with this flow. Or we might have information on the number of people who are currently estimated uh, as being infected. Um, you know, the number of active cases uh, that we see commonly reported in the COVID-19 pandemic. Or we might even have uh, some estimates of the number of recoveries going on. But typically a system such as this, um, and particularly more articulated systems that may, may have asymptomatic and undiagnosed versus diagnosed people, we're only gonna have uh, information on a fraction of this. Um, and that information will be from a particular point in time uh, about the state of the system. And uh, yet we're dealing here with a system which is evolving over time. And much of this course is about bringing together those observations of a system, of pieces of a system at particular moments in time with a model such as this to, to come up with a fused consensus estimate as to really what's going on. That's the province of what are called filtering techniques. So this is a model of a, of a system with substantive latent state that's not directly observable typically. We rarely can observe, for example, the number of susceptibles out there um, in and on its own terms without doing a prohibitively expensive seroprevalence study, for example. Um, and I noted this, a model like this is useful for understanding contagion well beyond um, uh, spread of, of pathogens, but in the context of pathogens is a particular key interest. We're gonna use the terms SIR throughout these lectures to, to denote um, susceptibles infected recovered, but be aware there's other notations such as X and Y, which is extant, um, no pun intended. Um, and we'll use N commonly to denote the total size of the population. Uh, okay, now um, I had noted last time that uh, the, the essentials of this diagrammatic notation 
And I had emphasized that it maps, um, it transliterates into uh, a set of uh, ordinary differential equations, um, such as those shown here. So uh, we have for each of these stocks or state variables, you could use either term, they're also called levels of compartments. Um, we have a particular element of a set of differential equations, a series of differential equations, a set of state equations. Um, so S has S dot associated with it that defines its rate of change over time. I has I dot, R has R dot. And um, we have M coming in, that's the, uh, that's the immigration. And we have this term leaving that represents um, infection. And it, and it bears noting that this particular flow becomes it comes from susceptibles and goes into infectives appears twice. One uh, associated with the susceptible side with a negative sign because it's leaving it and one with I coming into it and therefore with a implicit positive sign. Um, so um, this is a transliteration of this diagram into ODE form where we've lent short names for, for various quantities. Um, uh, here in the model. Um, now, we're going to initially deal with the simplifying case where we have a so-called closed population. What that means is we are following a cohort over time of people. They start in the model and they stop in the model and there's nobody else that comes in and there's nobody who's leaving. Um, so while this model has the capacity to represent people coming in, we'll just assume for the moment that that's zero, that the people that start in the model just shuffle around within it. There's a conservation of people for those um, who, are, who maybe uh, appreciate the language of physics. Now, the induced dynamics here um, is uh, one I flashed up last time, but which is gonna form the basis of more substantive discussion um, this time. And I, I wanna, we're going to come back to this diagram, so I want to make sure you're you're familiar with what it shows. So, what we see here is time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we we depict the number of people in each of these compartments, S, I, and R, in turn. S um, is is lent the blue color, so the blue curve represents at any one time, let's say time thirty-five, the number of people who are susceptible. Um, in the, the infective population, that's this middle category, um, middle compartment is shown as red and the recovered is shown as green here, okay? And um, I have to apologize, but um, because these can be of very different magnitudes, um, these are shown on, uh, in this case, two different scales. So the top and bottom one, the susceptible and the recovered are shown on a scale of going from zero to 2 million here at the top. Um, so uh, this would be 1.2 million. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, um, the, the population starts at that. And then uh, the number of, they start all susceptible. And uh, by the end of this time frame, almost all of them are recovered. Um, by contrast, the red curve, the infectives, are on a scale from zero to 500,000. So when you go to interpret the value for the red curve, uh, you should be reading kind of this, the, the tick marks, as it were, off this uh, middle, um, middle indicator. Okay. Um, and this is time, which we've said is in months here. Um, so a, a one unit time would mean one month. Um, so we see a characteristic dynamic here and, and its broad feature should not be that surprising. Susceptibles, given that immigration is zero um, and that there's no other outflows, susceptibles can only go down, right? Um, and they, in fact, they can only go one way, which is to infectives. So they are decreasing and just as the Night follows the day as they are decreasing, the number of infectives rises. Um, so we trade off uh, infectives, those susceptibles become infectives. 
And then in the fullness of time, those infected in turn become recovered um, and, and turn into recovered. And uh, infectives tends to rise exponentially at first. It's driven by this, a feedback loop associated with infection. Um, each infective infects more people and one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. That's what's going on here. Um, but then during this later portion, it's driven by recovery. Uh, so a number of infectives, people are infected now, recover. And the time constant associated with this tends to be driven by this mu here, excuse me, um, this, oh, this mean time until recovery here. Um, okay, so um, just as a reminder, C here is context per unit time. Beta is an indication of if there's a contact between a susceptible and an infective, what's the probability that, uh, that that contact will transmit, will lead to infection being transmitted? And mu is the mean time until people recover from infection, okay? And last time we introduced what's called a first order delay, which had one of the major idioms of it is you, you divide by mu. Um, so uh, this is a first order delay here. This is a mean time in this state variable, the stock. And the, the formula for this flow is therefore I divided by mu. If there's nobody to, be, to recover, there'll be no recoveries. If I is zero, there'll be no recoveries. If there's a billion people to re ready to recover, there'll, there'll be um, many recoveries. So it naturally depends on I. It also depends on you. If it takes a really, really long time to recover, 100 days, and maybe there's 100 people in the stock, about one per day will be coming out of here uh, on average. Uh, by contrast, if it takes only 10 days to recover, um, uh, on every day, these 100 people, roughly, it'll start with roughly 10 coming out of here, 100 divided by 10. So uh, that's kind of the basis for that, that formula. Um, okay, now these two uh, key parameters, C and beta, merit, I think, a little bit um, more discussion. The first is, um, if we consider the perspective of a susceptible, or indeed the perspective of an infective, how many people in total do they contact per unit time? Um, and, and that's how many people of any sort that they contact per unit time. Um, uh, if it, we're dealing with susceptible, some of those contacts will be with infectives, but some will be with other susceptibles. Some will be with recovered people. Um, so this is a total number. Beta, again, is that chance. If you have a contact between a susceptible and an infected, what's the chance the infection is transmitted? Um, and the key term that deals with this flow, with deals with this transmission, deals with this process of infection, whereby a susceptible is rendered into an infective, is this term here, um, as it leaves susceptible, as it comes into infective. And we noted last time and took it a different direction that this has an S times an I, and that made all the difference for the dynamics and the irreducibility of this. But here we're going to plow on and um, and talk about this uh, uh, the the term a little bit more. So um, we're going to have two different ways of looking at this term. One way to look at this term would be we have um, these preceding three factors: c times i over n times beta, quantity that entire thing, all times s, and that can be seen as kind of the number of susceptibles, that's this guy here, times some, I'll refer to it informally as a likelihood per unit time the susceptible will be infected. Uh, in fact, it's what we call a temporal probability density. Many of you may know this as a hazard rate, a chance per unit time. Um, if this model is measured in months, time is measured in months, if one and the unit spectrum means one month, then it's, it's the probability per month, 
somebody be infected. So this could be 1% per month, a susceptible be infected, for example. Um, so C times I over N times beta is a, is a hazard rate or a, a, a probability density. Um, it's not a probability. It can actually be greater than, than one. Uh, if it were two, it would mean people are on average infected in half a month. Each of these susceptibles, the mean time until they get infected will be half a month, 0.5 months, one over two months. Um, if it's a one, it means on average, it will take a month before susceptibles infected. If C times I over N times beta is 0.01, it would mean on average, it's 100 months until a susceptible is infected, one over 0.01. So this term here is a, we could also think of it as kind of a rate, a hazard rate is, is uh, a familiar term for those familiar with survival analysis. A chance per unit time a susceptible will be infected. And that's gonna be a key governor. In fact, it's so key, we, turn, we call it the force of infection, okay? Um, for those not familiar with hazard rates or are really puzzled by why I'm saying it's not a probability, why it's a probability per unit time, um, uh, I don't wanna have a separate module on this right now. We have too much to cover, but I put in some slides about understanding hazard rates. Um, and understanding them as kind of the results of a limiting process where we, we don't have just um, you know, a, a flip of a coin, whether we're infected after that month, but instead all throughout the month, we're having a chance of getting infected. You know, every day of that month, I'm having a chance of getting infected, every hour of that month. But as I go down finer and finer in time, that chance per hour is less than the chance per day. Um, and it turns out this gives rise to a situation where um, uh, my, as we consider smaller and smaller increments of time, if we consider the continuous uh, process, um, my probability of remaining in that state, in the S state, goes down as e to the minus alpha, um, alpha times the amount of time I've spent there. So I'm dodging bullets and it's uh, over time, it's less and less likely I've dodged all the bullets. Um, uh, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, if you're feeling uncomfortable with that distinction between a probability and a hazard rate, a probability per unit time, talk with me during office hours. Or if there's enough interest, um, I'll have a separate lecture, not during, off, not during the lecture times where I could, um, I could lead a discussion of this and, and give uh, a bunch of examples, et cetera. It is an important element of this sort of modeling to understand that we are estimating, like with this, um, when we're dealing with flows, that we're often estimating probabilities per unit time and not probabilities. Okay, um, so I'm gonna leave that, um, but I'm glad to, to cover it in a separate session if there's demand for it. Um, I could also, um, I might be able to refer you to a, a video on it. I think I made a video last year on it. Okay, um, so let's, let's talk about this imposing term. So we have this term here, and I talked about some intuition, thinking of this as something times s, but let's go tease this apart because it, it must look like you know, it's full of sound and fury, but to you, maybe it signifies nothing yet. Uh, it's a bunch of Greek letters mixed with, uh, with Latin in a most unholy uh, combination. So let's talk about it. It has um, a bunch of pieces and let's tease apart those pieces. We've talked about these pieces uh, here, C and beta. So hopefully you'll have some intuition with them. C is the rate of contact per unit time. So how many how many contacts someone has, say, per month? 100 contacts per month or five. And beta is a, prob is a, is a genuine probability, um, honest to goodness probability. Okay, so what is I over N? I over N is the fraction of the population members that are infected uh, at any one time, right? N is the total population I 
is the number of people uh, infected. Um, so when we have this entire term here, I over N, that kind of middle component of it is just the fraction of people who are right now infected, the entire population. C times I over N, if we think of kind of this one here, C times I over N, um, that is, if we consider, let's suppose we'll consider a susceptible and we consider who they're bumping into. Well, they bump into C total people per unit time, say per month. So maybe, maybe they run into a hundred people per month. Um, uh, then C times I over N is, is an approximation for how many infective people they run into per month. So maybe the number of, maybe the fraction of infectives in the population is 50%. Maybe I is 500,000 and N is a million. And, and so I divided by N is 0.5. So this is a person who runs into 100 people total per month. Um, and half the population as a whole is infective, then we'll say, well, this person probably runs into 50 infected people per month, that 100 times the 0.5. Um, that's the reasoning behind this term, why this term appears uh, here. Um, so we've, we're sort of piecing apart uh, that term that appeared back here in the equations, we, we've kind of got an understanding about why this is. Um, each susceptible runs into 100 people total per month. Um, of those people, what I over N of the fraction of them are infected. So C times I over N is the number of infected people they run into per month. And beta is a probability of transmission from each of those infected people they run into per month. And the approximation that is standard here, um, and it's been examined, one could relax the assumptions and treat it nonlinearly, but the assumption is that each of those confers an independent chance of, of infection. We're not taking into account the fact that, you know, if they were infected earlier, um, a little bit earlier, they're no longer infected because each of these is occurring to someone who's right now in the susceptible state still. So C times I over N times beta is, is this estimate of the probability that that person will get infected per unit time. So if they have contact with 50 infectives per unit per month, let's say, and each of those 50 confer a one out of a thousand chance that they'll get infected, then they have a 5% chance per month. That's the uh, 50 times 0 0.001, one out of a thousand, a 5% chance per month that they will be infected. Uh, and we call that the force of infection. That's the, that's the probability per unit time a given susceptible will be infected, okay? Um, so, uh, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a very fruitful way of looking at this term. Uh, it's from the perspective of the susceptibles. Um, what risk are they subjected to um, in terms of getting infected? Well, the force of infection answers that. It says on a per day basis, if they go, if there's, as they're circulating the community, their chance of getting infected, their probability of getting infected per day is given by the force of infection. And indeed, from a data science perspective, estimating this is of great interest. And the models which we've used for months to report, or for years now, to report to the federal government um, for, for all provinces across Canada, for, for the First Nations reserves, and uh, for provincial authorities uh, um, here and local authorities as well, uh, municipalities, uh, gives an estimate of that force of infection, that chance per unit time a susceptible will get infected, okay? So that's of strong interest to infer that using machine learning or statistical methods to infer what is that right now. 
um, to try to use the lens of dynamic modeling together with statistics and machine learning to estimate that. So we've understood that, but this, this term has a lot of secrets to offer. It's a lot of, it's a treasure chest which offers up a lot of intuitions. And there's another intuition it can offer up because of the property of the commutivity of, of multiplication. Um, this term here can be rearranged um, in a way that we put the S, oh, sorry, where the I is and the I outside. We just flip them because S times I is the same as I times S. Um, so all we do is consider the S as being inside and the I on the outside. Um, it's immaterial um, to, to the mathematics, but it's very material to the intuition. So um, uh, you recall, we looked at it this way uh, just now in terms of the risk uh, imposed on each uh, susceptible each day or each unit time. But instead we can rearrange it. So we look at it like this instead. We, it, we view it as I times C times S over N times beta. And this is just gives you a wealth of insight because what this is saying is look, for each infective person in the population, each person who's in that infective state, uh, they are, how many people are they infecting per unit time, okay? Um, and that's given by C times S over N times beta. Why is that? Well, we go through the same basic reasoning. Each of these infectives has contact with C total people per unit time, say 100. Um, suppose half the population is susceptible. Um, so of those 100 total people each infective bumped into, half of them are susceptible to infection. Half of them are capable of being transmitted to, forgive the, the lapse in my Queen's English. Um, so in total, C times S over N is the number of susceptible people per unit time each infectives is gonna run into. And you multiply that times beta, that chance of transmission per person they're bumping into and ignoring that we may bump into the same person again. Um, we're, we're gonna get, if it's a thousand, you know, one out of a thousand to transmit a 0 0.001 probability of transmission. Uh, they're going to be affecting on a per month basis, C times S over N times beta or 50 times 0 0.001 or 0 0.05 people per month. Now, we often give the, the name F for this term S over N. The fraction that are susceptible is such an important quantity, we call it F. Um, uh, for fraction. It's like the defining fraction we're interested in. Uh, and so this whole thing can be written as C times F times beta. F is gonna be central to our interest in our focus. Um, so here we've kind of rearranged this term so that uh, we think of it as a how many people each infective is infecting per unit unit time. And so we have a flow here that's equal to infectives times the total number of people each infective infects per unit time. And that dictates this flow as well. So that's two different ways of looking at the flow, two different faces it can offer, two different lenses by which you can look at this a risk imposed on, on each and every one of those susceptibles per unit time, or for each of these infectives, how many people are they infecting per unit time and multiplying the infectives times the number infected per infective. That's what uh, that, that flow is, okay? Um, now, one, one um, insight that comes from this way of viewing it, from the perspective of infectives, is that um, you recognize the governing role, the central role, the defining role, the foundational role of the fraction of susceptibles in the population. 
S over N has this overarching importance in limiting how much infection can spread. Um, and it, it determines it linearly here in this, in this flow. So, you know, if there's 20% of the, of the population that's infective, each infective will infect twice as many people per unit time as if there's only 10% of the population that's susceptible. Um, if there's 50% of the population susceptible, they'll be infecting five times as much as if, if there's only 10% of the population that's susceptible. So, you know, this fraction that are of the population that are susceptible is the, is the governing factor, is a key governing factor, arguably the single biggest governing factor that, that limits the spread of infection. Um, and as the number of susceptibles to the population falls, it throttles back, it restricts, it restrains, it limits the number, the efficiency of transmission by each infective. It prevents them from transmitting it to a, um, you know, to, to a broader set of people. Um, okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so over time, as susceptibles drop, if susceptibles are dropping over time, as they are in this closed population, population with no one else coming in, each infective is finding it harder and harder to infect others. Um, uh, and, uh, and it gets uh, harder and harder for them to pass on their one infection before they recover. Okay, so, so we've talked about this flow and I'm hoping that this formula here, um, which kind of is the defining feature of a, in fact, uh, of a classic communicable disease ODE model, seems less mysterious to you. There's all sorts of variants of this. It, it dresses up with all sorts of different masks and, and colors of dresses and hats on. But if you understand this, this formula, uh, you will be able to recognize the, the central element of countless infectious disease models. Um, it'll be mixed in with matrices. It'll be mixed in with different types of infectives, asymptomatics, symptomatics, be mixed in with different stages of infection at different, at different levels of uh, contagiousness. But you'll understand, um, you know, that's, that's just this, your old friend. It's just, you know, this, the, this, um, this one, he's just dressed up in, in different masks. Um, okay. Um, so building on that concept, the force of infection, building on this notion that the fraction of people susceptible in the population is this defining quantity. I want to introduce another key quantity in infectious disease dynamics and the focus once again of a great deal of data science inquiry together with these models. And that is the basic reproductive number. Um, goes by the name basic reproduction or basic reproductive number. Um, it's written as R0 as it might be pronounced in North America, but commonly uh, those in the mathematical modeling community, myself included, will refer to it as R0 with a nod to the fact that it was coined in the British context where zeros are referred to as nots. Um, so the basic reproductive number is um, uh, actually a, a somewhat more evolved construct than the force of infection. The force of infection applies um, and describes kind of um, what's going on at this very moment. The, the basic reproductive number requires you to think over a period of time, to wit, over the period of a person's entire course of illness. It's asking, about, uh, about something which also relates to how fast the infection can spread. And in a certain sense, like the force of infection has to do with infection spread. But here we're asking about what is the total number of people that will be infected by an 
an index, an initial infective, a single initial infective in a sea of otherwise susceptible people. A sea of people around them are all susceptible. So there's no limits uh, because some people are vaccinated or some people are recovered or already infected. There's no limits uh, because of those artificial things, so to speak, on how much they could pass on the infection. What's the raw contagiousness of this infection? when we consider it over the course of their entire illness, okay? Over the course, of, you know, between when they get it and when they recover, um, what's that total number they're, they'll, um, they'll infect? And you might expect this is gonna depend on a lot of things. Um, it's gonna depend on uh, the transmissibility, um, how, how many people, people are running into this, this index infective, this initial infective, how many people are they bumping into at a close enough range or in, in a situation where they could transmit it? So there's some element of human behavior there. Um, if it spreads with airborne, with aerosols, maybe the contacts are much broader. You know, I'm in contact with, uh, with a person located way across the room or in Australia, we have cases of it spreading from one hotel room to another hotel room um, through two doors that just happen to be open at the same time to retrieve meals in the hallway. Um, so contacts there, um, there might be many more contacts than what has for an airborne infection than if it's a bloodborne infection or a sexually transmitted infection or a, an infection that's based on, uh, um, uh, or even droplets. Um, so uh, it does depend on, contacts, the number of contacts uh, this index effective has per unit time and the length of time they're infected. If they're infected for, you know, a month, as it might be with gonorrhea, um, they might infect for much longer, for many more people over the course of it than if they were infected for two days. Um, so all those things are factored into this basic reproductive number for a given pathogen and context. Um, and it turns out that this is a central concept. Uh, uh, it determines whether the infection is spreading. Um, if I'm an infective and I'm in a sea of otherwise susceptible people and I can't even infect one other person on average before I recover, this infection is not gonna go anywhere in the population. If on average, I don't even infect one person, um, how is it gonna be even in a totally susceptible population, how is it possibly going to thrive in this population? Especially because over time, the number of people, the fraction of the population that's, that remains susceptible is going to be dropping. So this is like the ideal situation is captured by the basic reproductive number. I'm in the middle of all these susceptibles. And if it can't even spread then, I can't even guarantee I'm going to be able to pass it on to one person, um, chances are this is going to die out very quickly. You know, if, uh, if I so happen that I pass it on to one person, probably they won't be able to pass it on. So, so if the basic reproductive number is less than one, uh, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to spread. If it's greater than one, the epidemic is going to take off. Um, uh, it's going to start to spread. Um, and uh, it'll spread because one person, let's suppose it's two, one person before they recover, they've infected two. By the time they recover, there's two people have it. And each of them will in fact, maybe roughly a little bit less than two others. So two become four and it, and it goes on. And it turns out that this from a data science perspective, this is gonna be manifested in the data because the initial infective rise is going to depend on the, um, the basic reproductive number, as well as the amount of time um, people spend infected. And you can actually estimate the basic reproductive number based on the slope of that curve uh, early on, how quickly it is rising and knowing something about the, um, the, the duration of infection and the time between 
um, between successive generations of the infection. Um, okay, so for, for a model like this, if we consider this, um, um, we have this SIR model. Um, uh, we can ask about what's the basic reproductive number uh, for the situation associated with this model. Um, well, uh, remember the basic reproductive number is the number of individuals infected by an index infected in an otherwise disease-free equilibrium. Just to prevent misunderstanding, I'm going to say over the entire course of their illness, okay? Um, it's easy to, to miss that um, for people reading it the first time, but it's over the entire time they're infected. It's not per unit time. It's not per month. It's over the entire time they're infected before they recover. So what is the basic reproductive number for a, mo for a model like this? Well, you know, if we think about it, we think if everyone were here in the susceptible state, except one person, this index infected, this initial infected, they're surrounded by this ocean of susceptibles. Well, how many people are they gonna be able to infect? Um, well, let's think about it. Um, each of these infectives is gonna be mixing with C people in total per unit time. So maybe it's per month, right? Um, this infective is going to mix with C people uh, per month. All of those people, by what we're positing with the basic reproductive number, it's, it's in a situation where everyone is susceptible. Um, all of them are going to be susceptible. So they're mixing with C susceptible people per, per month. Each of those people they come into contact with, each of those, each of those C susceptibles they're meeting per month, they have a chance beta of transmitting to. Oh my gosh. So per month, they are transmitting to C times beta people on average per month. So if they're meeting 100 people per month who are susceptible, and each of them they have a chance of, you know, let's say 0.1 of transmitting to, a 10% chance of transmitting to each of those 100, they're gonna be infecting 10 people per month. That's 100 people, they're susceptible that they're meeting per month, each of which they have 10% chance of infecting. You know, they're gonna be infecting 10 people on average per month. And then let's suppose their infection lasts six months, right? Um, so it will be 10 per month times six months or 60. So in short, it's the number of contacts per unit time times the per discordant contact probability of transmission, say 0.1, times the average duration of infectiousness, because we're considering over the entire course of their illness, it's going to be C times beta times mu um, for this model. That's the basic reproductive number. Um, so for Omicron, um, you've got a basic reproductive number in the teens. Um, and so you'd expect this to be somewhere up in the teens for our society. But don't, don't lose track of the fact. People often lose track of the fact that, you know, um, it is somewhat context dependent. Uh, if you are living um, in a society which is exhibiting much lower rates of in-person contact um, uh, compared to a society where because of uh, inequities, uh, crowded housing, uh, poor ventilated homes, um, et cetera, um, tragically the situation and, and, and uh, some low socioeconomic groups, some of our Northern reserves, too many of our Northern reserves, um, have been left with low quality housing, um, uh, the basic reproductive number will be higher. And indeed our machine learning algorithms together with transmission modeling suggested um, basic reproductive numbers um, that were approached twice what we saw in the south of our province uh, when compared to unreserved communities 
and uh, other indigenous community, remote indigenous communities in our north. Um, okay, so this is the basic reproductive number. So when you when you hear people bandy about estimates of the basic reproductive number of the wild type um, of of uh, COVID-19 or of Delta or of, um, uh, or of Alpha, bear these in mind. Alpha was higher uh, by a factor of, I think, somewhere around 1.75 perhaps. Um, um, Delta was higher than wild type by a factor of two to three. Um, uh, and an Omicron is two to three times higher than that. Um, so uh, pe some people have estimated it's around the level of measles which is around 18, uh, about the most transmissible contagions one could imagine. Um, some people believe it's somewhat below that, but it's formidably transmissible uh, within, our, within our societies. It might, in fact, if someone's surrounded by all susceptibles over the course of the illness, they might, in fact, you know, uh, uh, 15, 18 people before they recover. Okay, so that's the basic reproductive number. It is a foundational concept that infectious disease epi, and it is one that's associated with our models. Now, it turns out that in this case, we were able to derive this fairly straightforward. Not all models is that the case. For example, an agent-based model, where we have lots of people circulating in different environments. We have homes and we have workplaces and we have long-term care facilities and different sorts of people and so on. Doing a, a closed form calculation to say, what is the basic reproductive number implied by this model, used by this model is, it's not as easy. We often will compute it numerically, computationally through experiments. And in fact, for a big articulated stratified model like this, where we have multiple age groups and um, maybe different socioeconomic groups, um, doing that calculation might also require some, um, uh, some finesse. Okay, um, let's talk now about the effective reproductive number. Um, the effective reproductive number has um, uh, has great deal of similarity with the basic. It's a generalization of the basic. Confusingly, it's referred to by different subcommunities in different ways. Some people refer to it as R, R of T um, or index by T as a subscript. Others refer to it as R star. These are all common ways of referring to what's called in, in terms of words, effective reproductive number. And it's like the basic reproductive number, but in a more general context. The basic reproductive number was for the very specific context where people were, were uh, surrounded by a disease-free equilibrium. They were surrounded by a situation where commonly it's all susceptibles. Um, uh, here, for effective reproductive number, um, it's a similar concept. We're looking at the number of persons an index effective will infect over the course of their entire illness, but in the current context. And that current context may have some people around them vaccinated, some people around them already infected, some people around them recovered. So in short, they may be surrounded by lots of people. Maybe they have contact with 100 people per month, but maybe 90% of them are not, in, not susceptible. So that infective is gonna to have to really work to infect people before, you know, per month. And they might not infect many over the course of their illness compared to what they would have infected in an otherwise uh, susceptible population. Um, so here um, we have a very similar conceptual construct and Often for groups, I will explain the effective reproductive number first, and then go on and, and say the basic reproductive number is the specialized version of it. It's, the, it's like taking the effective reproductive number for a very particular, special, important context, namely that it's all susceptibles except for this index infected. Um, 
it's kind of the, the worst case for the effective reproductive number where we're in an epidemiological context where everyone is susceptible. Okay. Um, and just like the basic reproductive number um, governed the spread of infection, so does the effective. If, if right now the effective reproductive number is greater than one, the number of cases will be rising. Um, a person who's infective is going to be able to spread it on to more than one person before they recover. So by they recover, they will have found two people to whom to bequest their infection. And each of those two people, before they pass it on, maybe be able to pass it on to another two people. So it becomes four, et cetera. And if it's less than one, the number of cases will, will fall. Um, and this is of key importance in the endemic equilibrium where the basic, re the effective reproductive number will be in balance, so equal to one. And in equilibrium, each effective replaces himself by one um, replacement. Um, and there's just a changing of the guard and they, they get replaced uh, by one person. Okay, um, so uh, here, if we relate the effective reproductive number to the basic reproductive number, um, in most cases, it'll simply be this relation here. Um, the effective reproductive number, the reproductive number at a given time will be equal to F times the basic reproductive number. Um, so the, if the basic reproductive number is 18, um, but uh, that would mean I'm an infective, I can infect 18 people. If everyone around me is susceptible, I'll infect 18 people before I recover. But if only half of them are, are eligible for infection, only half of them are susceptible, um, then I'm only going to infect 0.5 times those 18 before I recover. Um, and so the effective reproductive number will commonly be equal to F, where F is the fraction of the population that's susceptible, that's our foundational uh, point of interest, uh, times the basic reproductive number. And once again, you see if we can lower, if we can get fewer people susceptible, if we can lower the number that are susceptible, such as through vaccination, we, we lower the effective reproductive number uh, proportionally, assuming that people don't take compensatory behavior. They don't start circulating more once they're infected. Oh, sorry, once they're vaccinated, which they tend to do. Um, so, uh, I should, and, and I emphasize that in an endemic equilibrium, the effective reproductive number is, is one. Okay, so let's talk about some of the implied dynamics from this. Um, we've got limited time here, but um, uh, I'd like to explore this. So if we consider this model, we should be pretty familiar with these terms. The length of time someone spends infective before they recover and C and beta should be old hat now. And we're gonna consider a case of a closed population, so the immigration rate equals zero. And what we see is this graph that we saw earlier. Um, uh, and uh, we can uh, inquire um, some as to um, the behavior here. So we could, might ask like, under what conditions does the count of infectious individuals decline? You notice this is rising and uh, here it's falling. And there's, there's, um, two ways to sort of think about this, a way that's sort of more global in a way that's more particular. So a way to think about it that's more global is, well, look, it's going to be declining. This is going to be declining. I is going to be declining. The red graph is declining if there's the outflow of infective is greater than the inflow. If, if there's more people leaving that are coming in to infective, it's the number of effectives are going to be going down. Just like if your bathtub is losing water faster than it's coming in, it'll, its level will be dropping. Um, and that's one way to understand why it's dropping here. The number of recoveries per month is greater than the number of infections per month. 
It's a very useful lens to put in it when we're thinking about hospitalizations, the number of people in hospital, the hospital census, for example. Um, so that's one way to think about it. Um, uh, there's another way too. Um, uh, and by the way, we can we could solve under what uh, conditions uh, this is this is true um, by relating those two flows uh, with their underlying um, their underlying uh, gosh their underlying equations here. I'll go copy these here so we could refer to them. I should have more artfully placed them uh, back here. Um, and uh, here, right. Um, okay. Um, so back into this, uh, the outflow will be greater than the inflow uh, when this is greater than, than this. Okay. Uh, oh gosh, I put them. Um, oh gosh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, so when the inflow is less than the outflow, that would imply this whole quantity is less than one. Um, and I don't know if you recognize uh, this quantity. Does anyone recognize what this quantity is? If you rearrange it, so C times beta times mu are multiplied together. Does anyone recognize what this quantity is? What is this that we have a name for this quantity here? That mathematically is the same as something I just introduced about five minutes ago. It has three words in it. That's the basic reduction number. Uh, it's, it's actually the effective Four seconds. It's the effective reproduction effective. number. Oh, yeah, effective. because we have S over N times this is. C times beta times U mu, you're absolutely right, is the basic reproductive number. And then we have the fraction of susceptible of susceptible's time set. And that's going to be the, um, the effective reproductive number, fraction of susceptibles times the basic reproductive number. Okay. So, so that's what that is. So what this is saying is it's declining when the effective reproductive number is less than one. Oh, and that's the same as saying. An index person infects fewer than one person over the course of their illness, right? Um, it's that's that's what the effective reproductive number is. It's how many people a given a given infective is going to infect over the entire course of their illness, given the current context, which is defined mostly by the fraction that are susceptible. So um, these two are equivalent. Um, outflow greater than inflow. That occurs if and only if a person, an index infective, infects fewer than one person over the course of their illness. It's the same mathematical condition. Um, uh, and so what's happening here um, is governed by these basic principles. Um, so we can understand, using the tools we've built up, we can understand this dynamics. Um, um, this rapid rise uh, and then this plateau and this decline are driven by these basic factors. So initially, each infective is going to be surrounded overwhelmingly by susceptibles. So S over N is going to be approximately one, right? That they're, each infective is infecting uh, for each time unit, each month, they're infecting C times beta times S over N people. Um, C times S over N is the number of susceptible people they're infecting per month or they're encountering per month and times beta is the number they're infecting per month. Um, and uh, at initially S over N is gonna be about one. And so they're gonna infect C beta people per, uh, per, per time unit and at the maximum possible rate. And the rate of recoveries is, is zero. So in the short term, we're gonna have this this rapid multiplication of infection. Each of them is going to infect, let's say, uh, 18 people before they recover. And then each of those 18 is going to infect 18. And each of them is going to infect 18. And so you get this compounding um, going on uh, by which they're infecting more and more and more. And it's very limited. 
there's almost, no, you know, almost everyone around them is susceptible. So they're very efficient about passing it on. So it's going to double, 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 double um, early on. And that's why we see this, this success of doubling. For those uh, understanding it through a system dynamics lens, there's this positive feedback occurring uh, associated with that. Um, but, you know, as that starts to go on, it can't go on forever. Um, uh, at some point, the jig's going to be up and the susceptibles are going to start declining here. Um, uh, th that, you know, initially it's a sea of susceptibles, but slowly that sea is drained. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the number of susceptibles is going to be reducing, um, but it's going to be reducing, you know, modestly. And so for a while, it's going to be going up in this doubling, 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 this exponential way, where early on it's going up in a way that is governed as the exponent of R0 minus one divided by the duration of infectiousness. Um, now, uh, over time, um, there's fewer and fewer susceptibles. And so each infective is going to, they're going to have to work some to, to infect a lot of people, right? It's no longer a given. Everyone around them is susceptible. So they're no longer infecting 18. Maybe now they're down to 12 people per unit time. Now down to, or sorry, over the course of their illness, now down to 10. And um, the rate of infections per, per infective, the number of new infections they're able to promulgate is, is going down. And many of these infectives are going to start recovering as well. So they're going to they're going to be here. They're, they're less and less able to bring new people in here. And some of them are going to be recovering. So what started as a huge imbalance um, with almost no recoveries and all these people coming in, and therefore I was rising really, really quickly. It's now increasingly I is going to be rising, but you know the gap between the rate at which people are coming in, say 100 people per month, the rate at which they're leaving, say 50 people per month will be smaller. And it's getting harder and harder for them to bring these in. So maybe this will go down to 75 people per month, and this will go up to 60 people per month. And this will go down to 70 per month, and this will go to 65. And so I is rising, but less and less quickly, right? Um, and then at this top, level, we have this kind of tipping point where, what is the case? Can anyone tell me? Um, give me one condition, even, even one condition by which if this is flat, it's no longer rising, it's no longer falling. What does that tell us is going on? Um, you should be able, to, there's actually two different ways we could describe it. One more global, involving stocks and flows, involving the flows, um, the flows involving I, um, and another way involving, you know, what each infective can achieve. So in terms of the flows, when this is no longer rising and not falling, what is that telling us is true about these two flows? If a bathtub has water draining out and coming in, but it's totally in stasis, it's not going up or down, what does that tell you about the rate at which water is going out and coming in? The inflow is equal to the outflow. Equal. Yeah, they're equal. equal. They're equal. These two are equal. So we're having a number of recoveries per month equal to the number of new infections per month, right? Um, uh, that's one way to view it. Can we say this from the perspective of a, of a given infective? So there are these infectives and they're working to infect people. I hope not, but, but just imagine this, right? Um, uh, we've got all sorts of weird things going on right now in our society. So imagine each infective is trying to infect people. At this point, how many people are they infected on average? It's a beautiful number. One. One person. They're replacing themselves with one stinking person, right? Before they recover. They're finding one person to pass it on to. So that the total number, it's just a change to the guard, the total number remains the same. Um, that's what's going on at that level. Each infective affects exactly one replacement at this level. Okay, so 
inflow equals outflow, or you could think of it in terms of the effective reproductive number is equal to one, it's flat. And whatever the effective reproductive number equals one, it's going to be flat in general for endemic equilibrium. And then after that, it's all downhill from there. Going downhill, there's, there's two things occurring. Number one, um, recoveries are greater than, than, in, in, than the incidents here. The people leaving I are leaving I faster than are coming in. Maybe there's, there's still infections going on. The susceptible is still dropping. Even after this peak, there's still infections. See that? The infections are still occurring. Susceptibles are being drawn down. It's just that the recovery is occurring faster than the infections are occurring. So I is dropping. That's one thing that's occurring that's dragging this down. The outflow is greater than the inflow. But another way, another thing that's feeding into that process is each of these infectives finds it harder and harder to infect new people because S is becoming lower and lower and lower. They're having to really sweat, really work. Many of them don't even place themselves with one person. And, and there are fewer and fewer infectives to infect them too. And so we're having a kind of collapse of the number that can get infected. Um, there's fewer susceptibles to infect and there's fewer infectives to infect them. And the number of infectives is increasingly being driven by recoveries and not, you know, many are recovering before they affect anyone. And so that's what's dragging this down. And we get the finale of the, um, of the outbreak. Um, and, uh, you know, we have uh, it driven by basically this recovery uh, recovery um, uh, uh, feedback. We could think of this as different feedback dominance. I rather like this perspective. Uh, early on, we have feedback that's driven by spread of infection. Um, then we tend to get um, feedback uh, that's occurring in terms of depleting the number of susceptibles that's kind of driving it. And then we get feedback through recovery that's driving it in this later phase. And we get what's called shifting feedback dominance within this model that some people have mapped out mathematically. You can actually map out which feedback is dominant within a model such as this at a given time. So as we look at those outbreaks, as we look at what's going on in Quebec and Ontario and BC, um, uh, we may see a shift in feedback dominance from where Omicron was spreading exponentially to where it was plateauing and then where it's starting to decelerate. And you can be confident that these sort of dynamics are playing out there. So there's basically two cases that are, um, that are possible here. One, you have an outbreak and it's basically governed by this and we could um, calculate um, the maximum count of infectious cases uh, here, and uh, uh, by in in so doing, we can um, figure out the uh, the conditions under under which that's occur. At this place here, um, I will note the fraction of susceptible. Given that the effective reproductive number is one at that peak. What is that telling us about the fraction? So remember, at that peak of infectives, the, the, uh, the effective reproductive number equals one. And if you remember, the formula for the effective reproductive number is given by this, F times R0. What is F times R0? What is F, anyone? What is F? F is the... Force of infection? No, it's the force of infection is written as lambda generally, a factoid. Uh, it, it, F is the fraction Fractions that are susceptible. Fraction of susceptibles. Susceptibles. And, yeah, and if this is equal to one, what does that tell us about what the fraction of susceptibles must be equal to? In terms of R naught, what is it equal to? If F times R zero equals one, what is F must what must F be? You folks could do this in your head. Uh, if one uh, I'll do, 
yeah, it's one over R naught, right? If if it's a simple simple algebra here, right? If if this thing, hey, come on. Um, uh, if this thing equals one, then it implies that f equals one over R naught, right? Um, so at that peak, the fraction of people who are uh, susceptible uh, is uh, oh. Is it R01? I'd like to meet R01, but there we go. I'll, I will copy this uh, into, uh, into here. Um, so at this peak up here, um, we have at that peak, F is equal to one over R0. Um, so the fraction that are susceptible at this peak, if you go down and you look at the fraction that are susceptible here, it turns out it's one over the basic reproductive number. Um, and it declines from there. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, so, so that's one possibility here. The other possibility, I'll just say, and we could depict this in state space, uh, incidentally, where we start susceptible. We have lots of susceptibles, few infectives. And then people become more and more people become infective and fewer are still susceptible. And it reaches this peak um, where susceptibles is one over the basic reproductive number, and then it collapses down. Um, we have fewer susceptibles, fewer effectives, both because people are recovered. Um, and we could plot this out in a state based plot. Uh, these arrows show if we started anywhere here, where would we end up going? They show the, the differentials, um, the vector field. But there's a second case where the infection declines immediately. Um, uh, the infection will decline immediately, even in a totally otherwise totally susceptible population under what condition? Can anyone say? Under what condition would it not even spread? If, if the basic reproductive number is what? If I'm an infective, and I'm surrounded by a sea of susceptibles, under what case will I, will the number just drop um, if I infect what? Fewer than? Fewer than? One. One. <laughs> one. one. Fewer than one person, right? Um, if I am, if I'm gonna, on average, in fact, fewer than one person, even in, if I'm surrounded by susceptibles entirely, because maybe, um, you know, maybe there's such good public health guidance in place, um, then it will collapse. And much of the goal of the public health system, of course, is to make it so um, there's enough people vaccinated that even if everyone around me is is who's not vaccinated is susceptible. If if there's all these vaccinated people around me, um, and then everyone else is susceptible, it will still collapse. It, we want to make the the reproductive number at that state where um, the only non-vaccinated people are susceptibles less than one. In which case, it will just drop off. If we have someone fly into the airport with the bug. On average, they won't even infect one person because so many people around them are vaccinated that you know there are those susceptibles around, but they're such small a number that on average they won't even infect one person and it will just peter out the infection. Okay, it'll just die out. Okay, so those are our two cases of uh, for uh, a closed um, uh, a closed population um, and. Uh, you know, I was going to talk about dynamics in an open population, um, which will introduce issues of equilibria. And um, I will think about doing this. I might just refer you to a video so we could get into the first data science material. Otherwise, we'll use part of the lecture next time for this. Um, and we'll, we'll be discussing kind of similar criteria uh, for, for why we see the dynamics here. Um, okay, um, so that's all we have time for today. Um, what have we done? Um, well, we've reviewed um, the basic structure and dynamics 
associated with uh, uh, with infectious disease models for the very important case of an outbreak in an otherwise closed situation. Outbreaks like might occur over short periods of time where you don't have to worry about people coming in and leaving. If you're dealing with outbreaks over years, of course you have to worry about people coming in. Um, babies are born, but um, if you're dealing with them over a very short time and not many people die, a closed form, a, a closed population might be fine. Um, we also have been dealing with these models, which are depictions of processes of the underlying process. And we see that they provide a mechanistic description of how infection spreads. One that's built up by kind of thinking about you know, how it, how it spreads from one person to the other according to these probabilities. And this model is mostly latent. Um, it's depicting latent factors in the situation, but it depicts their evolution over time that may give rise to data we do observe, like about the number of new cases and the number of people sick at any one time or the number of recoveries. And we see how that induces behavior over time. These are our transmission models of infectious disease that form the, the, the focus of so much of the machine learning and, uh, and uh, computational uh, statistics uh, of this course. Um, so uh, I'm going to break now. And uh, I would welcome people for office hours. I'll be taking just a couple minute break and we'll be back and we can continue office hours. Xiao Yan will be uh, joining a group uh, very likely at 1 p.m. But one way or the other, uh, our time, um, uh, and uh, one way or the other, that group will be going forward. If Xiao Yan can't be there because of illness on her part or family member's part, I will be there. Um, and I will do my best to be there for part of the meeting in any case okay, um, to discuss possible project ideas. But I look forward to discussing some of those with you here in office hours as well. So thank you very much. And uh, I will look forward to interacting with some of you shortly. I will also be posting an exercise based on today's material, um, probably tomorrow during the day for people to pursue, okay? Um, that will hopefully um, build up some understanding with respect to these uh, models and their dynamics. Thank you very much. Take care there.